uh, sorry, in English. We're going to listen to a presentation by Nancy Beers about uh, keep, keep, play, repeat. So uh, you have the floor. Yes. Welcome. Very happy to be here again. I think Kubert is still here, so I have to uh, keep it in English, and that's perfectly fine by me. Thank you very much. So uh, maybe you're not the only one, but uh, I'm Nancy. I'm a happy scrum master. You can find me at happyscrummaster.com, uh, and I do scrum mastering. Uh, there's not, not a big surprise there, I guess. I have been active in open source for uh, for a long time in the Drupal community for a while, uh, but uh, for the last four to five years I uh, did some other stuff, but here I am back again uh, in the community. I still am an open source hippie. I'm in love with Paul, he's in the back of the room. I met him at DrupalCon London years and years ago. Um, and um, I'm a freelance Scrum Master slash Hedgehog Coach slash Play Facilitator. I do all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, and currently I do that four days a week at ABM Emro. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, four days a week at ABM Emro. I don't know if you ever heard of the Dutch people heard of Tiki, uh, the app to pay. Uh, yeah, I, that's one of the teams I'm working with. Uh, so we're building uh, actually pretty cool stuff. Uh, and uh, the, the, big, the game I like best is, is playing Team Animal. Um, and I'm back at Drupal Jam again, so I'm very happy to do so. Uh, this is a talk I did uh, also at the DevOps Days in Amsterdam last Wednesday. Um, and it's not quite the same night. I'm very happy to be back at this community again uh, for at least a day. Today I'm going to be talking about. Uh, um, how you can use play and playfulness in the workspace because I really have a problem with the whole terminology called work hard, play hard because I don't think they have to be separated I think you can work hard by playing hard and those are not two separate things uh, so the last couple of years I've been very active in uh, the playfulness community called Play14 and I even lured Cooper in there so he has been to Play14 in London uh, last year, and we'll probably attend another one because once you go to play for a team, you will never go back. Um, this is what I like doing. Uh, there's an organization on the left, and uh, I want to turn it into an organization on the right. And I think the top of Kuber perfectly explained how, to, how you can do that. Um, I do that while using Scrum. I'm also an agile agnost, so if you want to go Kanban with me, I'm fine with that. Uh, but for now, this is my poison of choice, uh, and these are the three most important uh, values I use to do so. Um, they are also in the Scrum Guide. There is more in the Scrum Guide, also, because it also says what the Scrum Master should do. Uh, it's only one page, <coughs> and for me it's pretty great that it says it is only one page, because uh, I can be a jack of all trades. For instance, I do a lot of playification and gamification because I think it says so in the Scrum Guide. It doesn't say it literally. Um, I have three things to do as a Scrum Master. The first one is service to the team, make them self-organizing, make them transparent, uh, make great, create great feedback loops. The second one is help your product owner, so um, uh, to help them create a great backlog and a nice purpose for what you are building, where, you, where we are heading with our product. And the third one, it says, the service to the organization uh, causing change. Uh, and that's actually a very wide angle. And for me, that's perfect because I can make a great umbrella and hang everybody, uh, everything uh, under that on what I think is causing change. And one of the things is, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I became a certified chancellor so I can massage my team members so that it become more agile within their body, physically, because I think that's a good way to... And yeah, so I'm um, one of the guys at the ADN said, I think you're the, um, the best paid chair in the Netherlands. And I said, no, I'm a scrum master with benefits. That's something completely different. Um, but I think it's causing change. It's a good way of causing change, because it's unexpected. And I said, here, I brought my chair today. Sit down, and let me give you a massage. That's sort of the shit. And that's what I believe in. So, but also causing change can be done by games. And that's something I rediscovered. I rediscovered playing a couple of years ago, and I was like, oh my god, I 
I forgot. Is that my microphone that is zooming? No, it's a fridge. Oh, it's a fridge. Okay, thank you. Um, so I rediscovered playing. I forgot how much fun playing is and how much you can learn actually from it. Um, because if you look, <coughs> for instance, at animals, I think that's my next slide. That's not my next slide. Um, this is also what I do. Experiment a lot, uh, create and share ideas, and do crazy stuff. Um, but the point of the matter is playing is very primitive. Uh, it's if you look at uh, at lions or kittens or dogs or monkeys or any other type of animal, they all play to learn when they're little. How does a leopard learn how to hunt by playing? Um, it's even shown uh, in some of the documentaries on apes that they actually take turns when they play <coughs> and they get pissed off when someone is not following the rules. So it's a very primal thing. And uh, this guy is called Johan Huizinga and he's, he's written a book in 1938 called uh, The Homo Ludens, The Plain Human. Uh, and he said that playing is the basic base of, of all uh, culture and all humans. A human being is placed on earth to play after food and drink and sex and things like that. After that, the first thing he does is play. So it's the basis of all culture. And it can only be done when you felt free, when you feel free. Um, it was not that weird that he wrote. It's a Dutch guy that he wrote in 38, right before the Second World War. Uh, so playing is a very primal thing. People do that. I think my speakers know it's there over there. Can you handle this? <laughs> yes, that helps. So I can sneak peek every once in a while. It's a fairly new talk, so uh, you're my guinea, you're my guinea pig audience. Um, playing is also very good for the brain. Uh, you actually make new connections when you play, and it's a great way to uh, try out complex systems. Um, so it's a very easy way to, and I actually brought a game today, so I'm, we're going to, to actually play at the end of my presentation to show how this works and why it works. So it's very good. They also did some, uh, some tests in Phoenix, Arizona with people with Alzheimer's. Uh, it was a, a group of uh, 3,800 um, elderly <coughs> people with Alzheimer's, and they couldn't prove exactly if the Alzheimer's uh, was getting better, but the way they connected um, made them more happy people. So it, there is no direct link between play, uh, playing and uh, uh, curing Alzheimer's, but there is a link between playing and at least make Alzheimer's people more uh, less anxious and more happy. So I think that's also a very good sign that uh, we might be using. Of course, it also helps with creative problem solving, getting out of your comfort zone, and uh, because of that, the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain will work together better, so uh, you will come up with way more uh, rational and also creative solutions on that. Of course, um, sitting is the new smoking, so uh, having people stand up in the room and, and uh, do some weird shit, like I like to do with my teams, uh, makes it um, makes it good for your body as well. Uh, you can do some weird ice breaking games that Cuba doesn't really feel like that much maybe sometimes. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can really get a crowd moving uh, while using games because somehow everybody is a little bit competitive and everybody wants to win or be the best or work together or at least have fun with it. And um, if we say uh, uh, people that make millions and millions of, uh, of, uh, of euros, uh, football players, we call them players, right? So um, sports is also called playing, and there's a reason for that. So it's perfect for your body. And it also helps a lot in relations. Uh, of course, openness helps, helps a lot, like you said, transparency and things like that. This is play on player set. Uh, one hour of playing is way better than an extra year long of conversations. If you play with someone for an hour, you really get to know them very well. So it's a good thing for one on one relations. I also use a lot of games like Big Talk, I'll talk about more 
soon uh, on how you can use games to get to know people very quickly. Of course, massaging someone also helps, but if, the, if that's too much uh, touchy-feely for you, you can also just play a game, right? So for relationships, it's great. Team building as well. Um, the funny thing is, oh, um, what I see is um, if you look at team building uh, things, so the word uitjes, team uitjes, Huh. <laughs> <laughs> What's a team huisje? I'm going to say field, field, field. Trip, thing, field, field trip, thingy, team. Yeah. <laughs> thing. Yes, of <laughs> uh, if, you, if you look at team building trips, let's call it trips for now, uh, you will see that almost every time it involves games. Always. We go on the beach or we go paintballing or we go, why is that? Because playing games is the ultimate best way to build teams. And uh, also enhance feedback loops. Uh, because most of the games you play in, in sessions like that involve feedback and direct feedback and transfer and local feedback. So playing helps uh, to build great teams. Universal. That's also for me a very um, good one at the moment because I work in a team with eight people and six nationalities. So I have Pakistan and India in one team. In that same team uh, I have a girl from China and a man from Brazil uh, and two Dutch people and missing, I'm missing Sudan. So I have six cultures in one team um, and that can be very hard because we don't always uh, understand each other that well. And gaming is a very universal way of uh, everybody will understand that and it will work like a charm to work together if you do that. So, you can make a better world by playing, that's, uh, that's all I want to say. And the last but at least same reason is, of course fun. If you ask people, why do you play games? Why do you go, why are escape rooms in Holland so booming? I mean, a couple of years ago nobody ever heard of them and now I think there are more than 700 in, in Holland alone. Uh, because it's fun and it brings joy. So, you, look, you should really play more in your day to day life. Uh, because it sparkles innovation, it sparkles team building, it sparkles everything. So, why not do that? Are there any business owners in the room? Which? Uh, this is a bonus for companies. If you let people play, and that's not just football, but also real games to get people involved with each other. You get more happy employees that are innovative, productive, motivated, and loyal. So I think that's perfect reason to, to play, right? Let me check my time. Uh, so now what? I told you all this. What are we going to do about it tomorrow? Because I promised in my, uh, uh, in my abstract that I will give you some tips on what to do tomorrow to well, Maybe not tomorrow, Monday. <laughs> Monday uh, to embed it into your day to day work life. So the first one is start small. Um, who of you guys use retrospectives? Okay, so yeah, almost everybody. Start small. Don't go ape shit on gaming because, for instance, last Wednesday I gave a workshop of two and a half hours involving thousand pieces of kapla, which are little wooden blocks. And I explain to people how DevOps work uh, in uh, two and a half hours. Of course, that's, that's a big game with a lot of work, but you also have small games, literally small games like this, Big Talk, uh, which you can start with a uh, with. Uh, you can get a good conversation going. Uh, so there are a lot of small games in the market to simply start with, with simple stuff. So don't think, oh my god, I have to do a board game for four or five hours, but there are small games to energize a team, to learn a team stuff. So that's the first thing. There is a game for everything. I'm sure of that. You can playify or gamify everything. Uh, I did a, a game on public speaking. I uh, developed a game about the GDPR, in which you can play for one and a half hours and people actually understand the law. Uh, that's, that's the best stretch I can find, I guess, of something completely boring to something very fun. Um, on 
feedback. I also have uh, have done games on Tao and Agile and Tai Chi, and there's all, there are all kinds of different games. And I am certain that if you search or ask me or anyone who's into playification, that there is a game for everything. So if you have a problem within your team and you want to solve it, just reach out to the gamifying community and we will figure it out for you. Uh, send your Scrum Master to play for team. Are there Scrum Masters in the house? Or are there people who are HR coaches? Which is practically the same, but not the time. Well, anyway, sort of. Um, play for team. Play for team. That's a, a, an open community. It's non-profit. Uh, it's all over Europe and even outside of Europe for, this, for the first time this year. Uh, it's a gaming conference uh, about serious gaming and serious play. Uh, it takes up to, a, it's two and a half days of playing games with other adult human beings. Uh, and um, yes, it's nice. I, uh, I went there two weeks ago to Bologna, that was the sixth time I went because Every game I play, every game I learn is from the Play for Team community, and it's really awesome because uh, everything is open content too, so you can use and share and make games better and do anything you like with that. So that is a perfect way to learn how to facilitate and how to become a better Scrum Master, I'm not sure of that, and to learn cool games. So that's a great way to learn how to play more. Uh, then I want to start with a little, little story, of, uh, finish, I'm sorry. Uh, this is me, a couple of years ago, and uh, with my dad on the stage, and uh, this was the age, I was, I was four, and uh, my dream at that age was I wanted to be on the stage and make people laugh. Uh, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Uh, I held on to the dream from the, the uh, age I was four to the age I was 17, and I applied for the Kleinkunst Academy, which is actually a theater school in Amsterdam, to become a stand-up comedian, or at least comedian. And I got through the first round, and I got through the second round, and the third round, uh, and sacked me. So I was like, yeah, sorry, you're, uh, you're not going to do the, to the, to the education there. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? Um, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went with 80 students to uh, Turkey to play games for five days with them and made some nice business courses. And I was on the stage and I was uh, telling stories about uh, all the things I do in my day-to-day life. And people were laughing and I was standing there and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm that girl. <laughs> so somehow um, I, I made it full circle and I made it came true. And my dad was also very fond of podiums. This was us a couple of years later. And uh, my dad always liked to play and have a lot of fun. And when he turned 70, uh, I asked him, Dad, what do you want to do for your birthday? And he said, I want to go to a roller coaster park with you. Yeah. So we did. And uh, this is a picture. Unfortunately, last summer, this was one and a half uh, years ago, um, and last summer he passed. So that's very sad. But the whole plane thinks my dad uh, played, uh, placed playgrounds all over Holland. So generations of children are playing on his work. Play it for me. Thank you.